Uh, good morning from Los Angeles. I know um, most of you will be uh, uh, in a different area. Today we have a embodied, carb embodied and operational carbon decarbonization in current and future building design panel discussion with uh, Larry Swain from Siegel and Swain Architect, Luke Leo from uh, SOM, and uh, Panu Pasanen from uh, One Click LCA. And I am uh, Eddie Santosa from IMAC. So the Presentation uh, is organized by IPSA USA Education Committee. So if you're interested to join, become a member, take a look at the link and uh, feel free to join the, the, uh, the become a member to enhance our building performance and building performance simulation. Today also we are fortunate that uh, one click is willing to sponsor this event. As you can see in the slide, one-click LCA is the world leading life cycle assessment and environmental product declaration generation software for the construction industry. A low carbon construction one-stop shop, one-click LCA provides solution for construction projects, product, and portfolio. It is used more than 120 countries, include the world's largest construction sector database and support over 60 standards and certification. So I think personally, my company also use it. It's a, have a been a, it's a fun uh, tools. And I think for, for me, the carbon designer is a very nice tool to use because you can do a life cycle assessment in early design uh, states. So this is also AIA class. I think uh, maybe uh, Mike will can uh, uh, share the link or the email that you need to send to AIA to get the credit. So you need to, unfortunately, you need to let us know with your number and, uh, and email uh, with the email that provided. So we have uh, three speakers. Hopefully, uh, Luke will join. I think Luke has a little bit difficulty, but he will join us uh, soon. Uh, we have a uh, Larry Strain, is a founding principal, Siegel and Strain, an award winning 28 person firm focus in the community project and sustainable design. He has been served in USCBC, Northern Cali California, working in the embodied carbon benchmarking with CLF. And he has uh, been read, uh, writing and speaking about embodied carbon material building for more than 20 years. I think if you see the 10 step in reducing carbon in the AIA website, it's, it was written by Larry Strain. The second uh, presenter, uh, is a uh, Luke Leung. Is a uh, is a uh, Luke. Is a uh, I know Luke personally, but like maybe more than 10, 10 years. Luke is a lead fellow, Ashray fellow, and he participated in many uh, task force in Ashray as well as uh, become a distinguished uh, lecturer for Ashray. He is a white firm director of sustainable engineering studio for Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. His project include Burj Khalifa, the current tallest building in the world, and four other four of the top 20 tallest building in the world. So if you have a question about tallest building, he will discuss about from a tallest building perspective. We also have a Panu Pasanen, the CEO and the founder of One Click LCA. Panu is a world leading construction uh, uh, lead the One Click LCA, the world leading construction life cycle assessment tool. He is a LCA expert with extensive 20 years experience and has been teaching uh, and trained a lot of construction professional and serve as an advisor to low carbon construction and to a state international organization and leading company. Uh, Panu has been joining us from Europe. So it's, thank you so much uh, for joining us from <laughs> another side of continent to this uh, event. So before I handing out to Larry Strain, I will make some of quick introduction about uh, carbon. What is carbon? Uh, although most of them probably know, are uh, going very quick. So what is carbon? It's basically CO2 emi equivalent emission that derived from a greenhouse gas uh, times with the global, global warming potential. As we know in a, uh, CO2, uh, equivalent or emission is the one the main dri drive of uh, climate change right now that become a main concern in many organizations as well as a company. 
carbon in, in building is basically divided into two embodied carbon. It's basically the material of the building extract from the extraction, manufacture, transportation, and construction. The other one is maybe from a lot of member of IPSA USA familiar is from operational carbon. It's basically from uh, uh, electricity and a natural gas. In a life cycle assessment, we also discuss a few uh, how we calculate the, and the scope boundary, what we calculate in a uh, life cycle assessment. There is a call scope boundary A, B, C, and D. And you can see each of category of this one. Usually for lead, you will talk about A to C and EPD usually only talk about A1 to A3. So I will uh, handling out directly to uh, Larry uh, and uh, Larry, uh, feel free to share your expertise and knowledge in uh, embodied carbon, especially for existing building. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Eddie. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, is that full screen? I think it is. So good morning. Um, I can skip a few of my slides because Eddie already showed them, so that's good news. Um, so we're going to talk about embodied emissions and how they relate to operational missions and why they're so important today. Uh, buildings, as you probably know, make up about 40% of all global emissions. And if you look at this graph, you might think that operating emissions are really what we need to focus because it's a bigger piece of the pie. Um, but there's an important distinction between embodied and operations. Operating emissions are incremental and ongoing and are high because we have so many existing buildings. They're from the buildings we already have. That's where that 28% comes from. Embodied emissions mostly happen at the beginning of a building life. What this means is for buildings built between now and 2030, about 80% of their emissions will be from embodied emissions. So that you can see the operational emissions rise over time, but the embodied emissions start out high. So in the current state of affairs with the climate crisis, the next 10 years are going to be critical. So for new buildings, we really need to focus on uh, embodied emissions and how to bring them down. So I'm going to skip these because you've already seen them. Operational carbon, um, embodied carbon. And this one I'm going to add, which is the definition is what I'm calling an avoided carbon, which is uh, really the emissions avoided by making one choice over another. For example, rehabilitating an existing building compared to demolishing and building a new one or upgrading an existing building compared to leaving it alone. So you can look at the, the savings uh, from those choices. <clears throat> so the first time that I really understood the importance of embodied carbon was on this project. The Portola Valley Town Center is a lead platinum project, very energy efficient, and it was built with a conscious effort to use low impact, low carbon materials. But we didn't really, we didn't really, uh, we did it after the fact. We went back and decided to calculate all the carbon emissions from the building, building the project. It's the first time, actually the second time that we'd done a full whole building LCA. So in order to calculate uh, the emissions of, for materials, you first have to know how much everything weighs. And the first thing we learned was that concrete weighs a lot. <laughs> These are wood frame buildings, clad in wood, wood paneling, wood ceilings, and some wood flooring and concrete still accounted for 80% of the total weight of these buildings. We then converted the weight into emissions using an LCA database. This was back in 2009 or so, um, the ICE database out of Bath, England. And concrete also accounted for the largest portion of emissions, but you can see it's a lot less than it is by weight. So about 40% of the total emissions were from concrete wood accounted all the wood accounted for about 12 percent and steel products a little over 13 even though we used half as much steel as wood by weight you can also see significant carbon emissions from the foam insulation even though we used a tiny amount by weight so the lesson from this was focus on the materials you use the most of and the carbon intensive materials so the high carbon materials and the high volume materials are what you really should pay attention to in reducing emissions we then modeled a base case building with the same design using standard materials, and we compared it against the materials we actually used in our building. The base case building was about 450 tons of carbon for the whole project and just the materials. 
And the as-built project was about 305 tons. It was about a 32% reduction. And most of that reduction, it came from a lot of little things, but most of it came from the concrete, which was not only the largest uh, contributor, but the, the biggest savings, about 80 tons of carbon saved by using a very high slag, high fly ash mix design. And this, we used a lot of salvaged wood, over 20,000 board feet of salvaged wood in this project. Um, and the reason that that shows as a negative number is that partly because the wood's not going into landfill and decomposing and burning, but also because the trees that we didn't have to cut down are still standing and sequestering carbon. So how do the embodied emissions compare with the operating emissions? As, as I mentioned, the buildings were very efficient. They used about half as much energy as a building designed to California Title 24 at that time. And a lot of that energy was supplied by PVs. These are some of the green features we used to accomplish it. And we even discussed eliminating natural gas, but design, this design happened in 2006, 2007, and the client wasn't ready to do that. So there were a lot of passive features incorporated, backed up by very small, efficient systems um, to heat and cool the buildings, mostly heat, actually. So the standard code compliant building, our base case building that we, we had modeled um, as, a, as a test case, uh, had about a total of 2,100 tons of carbon emitted over 20 years. Uh, embodied emissions were 450, the operating emissions about 1680, and this is a Title 24 code compliant. The, actual, the building we built was a little over half of that. So the embodied emissions went down and the operating emissions went down. So you can sort of see that the, uh, the savings were, were really significant, almost 50% over 20 years by this. And we were really not uh, doing low carbon design in the sense that every material was selected. We actually did this after the case, went back and checked how we did. And it uh, turns out we did pretty well. So the last thing I want to talk about is existing buildings. Reusing and upgrading existing buildings is going to be a key strategy to reducing carbon emissions. It accomplishes two things. The upgrade part reduces current emissions from all the existing buildings, which is 28% of global emissions. And the reuse part makes it possible to build fewer new buildings, thereby reducing future embodied emissions as well, which is 11% of the total. But we haven't had a tool right until now that could compare all the variables of embodied and operating carbon for different building and reuse scenarios. So this is a tool that we're currently developing that compares operating embodied emissions for a building retrofit and a new building. The tool compares the average operating emissions of an existing baseline building from the CBEX database versus the total emissions operating and embodied of a new replacement building and a new retrofit and a, and a retrofit of that existing building. You input the type of replacement building you want, you specify the level of renovation the building needs, the operating emissions are calculated from EUIs that you specify for both the new building and the retrofit, and then the different scenarios come with different embodied carbon values. This is what the dashboard currently looks like. You can see you can enter data in these gray boxes about your baseline, which also includes where the building is, which would include your climate zone, your grid efficiency, all kinds of things are built into this. And then you enter the retrofit information about the retrofit, how much of a retrofit. Each of these um, white boxes have drop-down menus. You can select different levels of uh, retrofit for different types of the build, different pieces of the building. And you can enter the type of new building. Is it, what, is it a heavy building, sort of a medium-sized building, a lightweight wood building? And it gives you an embodied carbon uh, number for each of those. And then it spits out a graph on the right. So the do nothing to the existing building, it's all, oper it's all in operation. There's no, you're not doing any embodied emissions. So it gives you the total emissions over the time frame you selected, which in this case was 15 years. Then you look at your retrofit of the existing building, there's a small amount of embodied emissions added and the, ret the operating emissions go down because you've made it more efficient. And then you look at building a new building and the operating, the embodied emissions go way up and maybe the operations go down even further, but you still look at something that over 15 years, the new building is probably going to emit more total carbon than just leaving the building alone. Uh, you can also see as a graph over time that the uh, retrofit for this particular project um, was became more efficient, fewer emissions than the existing building after about three and a half years. 
So it gives you a really quick way to estimate um, whether you should remill, remodel uh, a building and, add, and upgrade it or whether you should build a new building. <laughs> we all went on to look at other buildings over the last few years. Um, and we, this is sort of how buildings break down in our research, uh, large concretes and steel, um, you know, mid-rise, high-rise buildings are about 500 kilograms per square meter on average. Uh, medium mixed structures, so maybe a wood frame building over a concrete parking deck for affordable housing or something like that might be 325. And then a small light wood structure might be 250 kilograms. And then you can see at the renovation, when you actually can leave the structure and foundation mo mostly alone, it, go, it drops away down. You're just dealing with the envelope, the interiors, and the building systems. And it's possible to bring those even lower. So this just sort of shows the potential savings from renovation over um, new construction. This is the list that we came up with. It's on the AIA website, which is sort of simple rules of thumb and strategies to reduce embodied carbon. And you can see that at the top of the list, we put reuse buildings because we think it's probably the most important thing to do, followed by low carbon concrete, which is the biggest impact for most buildings. Uh, was that it? I guess that was it. <laughs> so I will turn it over to Luke. I hope he's on. Let me stop screen, stop sharing. That was kind of abrupt, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, uh, I'm here. <laughs> There's Luke. Let's see. The screen you are sharing is the slide sort, though we don't see the presentation mode screen in case you want two screens. Yeah. Now it's, now it's the presentation. OK, uh, so I really enjoy Larry's talk, especially the focus on, focus on existing building. So especially in America, if you are like me in Chicago, there are a lot of empty buildings in Chicago downtown that we can reuse. But once, once you get out of the US and look about the whole, think about the whole world, right? From now into the future, 30 years from now, 25% increase in population, 2.4 billion people. A lot of them are not in US, uh, maybe other countries. So for those countries, new building is a reality. In fact, if you look at the UN projection by the year 2060, we need 2.5 trillion square feet of buildings. It's almost the area of the entire view environment right now. And it's about the entire New York City every month from now to that year. So there's still a lot of new building, especially outside of US and maybe in selected location of US where there will be a population growth that we have to meet. So we still have to address the new building and the embodied carbon. So we can reuse existing building and recycle a lot of them, but chances are the embodied carbon of the new building will be still important. And you've seen this chart before about the operation versus the embodied carbon. The operation piece is more important today. Guess what happened in the future? You have seen this uh, probably in different environment, the numbers could vary. But the blue on the left is operational carbon. Right now, the grid is 30 significant. Looking into the life cycle of a building, a lot of that is operational carbon if the grid doesn't change. What if we clean up the, the grid, the electric grid, everything electrified, you move to the next column. What is that orange thing, orange block, which is quite big in the second column? That's refrigerant and it's leakage. So that will become the biggest piece. One of the highest GWP among all elements is refrigerant. If we get rid of the refrigerant, so what we'll end up with is the third and the fourth bar is the upfront carbon and the end of life carbon. So the point here is as we move forward and we focus on getting rid of the operational 
carbon emission, the refrigerant and the upfront and end of life carbon will be more important. You have seen this before, EN15978, uh, EN not 15975. So there's this whole life carbon of different um, categories. If we focus the operational carbon, that is only this piece here, right? So much of the carbon in this chart here is embodied and recycled and elements like that. In terms of operational carbon, let's focus on that for a moment. Coals are coming, right? Uh, you have New York, local non 97, and a series of other coals or zoning regulation. I really enjoyed this one from city of Boston. On the operational side, different building types from now to 2050. This is the operational carbon you're gonna have to meet. It could be punit punitive to you if you don't get into that level of performance. So this is laying our roadmap from now to 2050. We are seeing more traction on this stuff that people start addressing that. SRA 90.1, you probably see in the latest appendix AG, there's a table start converting all the energy to carbon. So that is out for public review, right? So even SRA 90.1, there's a movement towards carbon, which is already out there for public review. So we can see continued movement in the carbon, switching from energy to carbon, just like city of Boston. We also seen different cities, location around US start considering moving into all electric banning fossil fuel, especially in California. December the 8th, I think the executive order calling for net zero operational energy of all GSA building by 2030. That's only eight years from now. And it's an executive order. And they are looking at 100% zero emission vehicle acquisition by 2035 and 2027, 100% of light duty vehicle executive order for the government. So this movement is not just in the building, it's also in the vehicle. It's kind of like the lead carbon zero, which exactly what we are looking at here. When you go to lead zero carbon, you probably know that already. You have to address both the building and the vehicle emission. So this discussion will be interesting on the operation side, not only just limited to the building, but also the vehicle. Now, let's say if we indeed by the year, you know, 2035, our grid all clean up, then moving into the embodied carbon. Now we focus on the embodied carbon, which is this piece here. The first piece upfront carbon, you have been seeing a lot of stuff addressing A1 to A3. Um, on the MEP side, as Ray start thinking about maybe working with the TM65 to have that version of upfront carbon start addressing in the MEP equipment in US. But the interesting thing is here, when we think about this upfront carbon, this is the UK version of it. Now, um, that, that version here, the interesting thing is there's two approach to this upfront carbon, uh, to this uh, building and body carbon. The first approach is the building scale approach. It look at the whole building scale, like Larry talked about earlier and try to ratchet down from the holistic building. But then cities like, or the counties like Marine County, they taking this, what we call material approach, which rather than address the whole building, we focus on certain material and, and start po providing limits to that material. So this baby step of material move towards a more holistic whole life carbon of the entire building. Now with Vigeran is one of this baby step we can make. So I can tell you that um, a part of the ASHRAE decarbonization task force is looking at this whole refrigerant and we'll come up with the information more to come about that. So, but the idea is to start making baby step on the material and move towards this, you know, whole building and body carbon and start ratcheting, ratchet them down, just like the operational side. 
So in this executive order is requesting GSA building to focus on embody carbon too. So, you know, that's coming. A4 and A5 is the second portion of it in the kind of the upfront carbon, but is more dealing with the transportation. And then is the in use portion of the embody carbon. Now in the in use portion of the embody carbon, people has been focusing on the refrigerant and have guidelines to say, uh, some of the code require 750 GWP or lower. So you can see what are the refrigerant, which is the green one is lower than GWP of 750. But in other countries, for example, this building we are doing in Australia, in Sydney, the local team already moved towards a GWP of less than 10. Now, we had, whether that will come to America sooner, we don't know yet, but like definitely that movement towards low GWP refrigerant is coming. In certain parts of the world, it's already much lower than we are. So the refrigerant piece actually um, is important as you saw earlier, and it appears in different parts of the embody carbon. Wait, why is refrigerant and embody carbon? right? Why is it not operational carbon? Well, here's why, because if we focus on the EN15978, refrigerant comes with the building. So during the operation of the building, the refrigerant can leak, but that is, a, that is what we call a maintenance and refurbishment of like what the embodied carbon is missing. It's almost like during a building come with embodied carbon, in the in use stage, the building will have maintenance you're gonna do now, but you don't count those as your EUI, right? You count it as just, you have to fix the building. Same as the refrigerant, you count it as, you just have to fix the refrigerant. That's why it's not part of the operational carbon. Like this guys here, the EUI, which you have to put energy into the building is very different than the idea of refrigerant leakage, which is something you have to fix on the and on the embodied carbon side. But the confusion is, if you look at scope one emission, is actually count as a fugitive in scope one. So depending on where you look at scope one emission, versus or versus you look at LCA framework in the LCA framework, refrigerant is actually embodied carbon, not operational. So finally is the end of life carbon. And then you have to have the circular economy. That is the whole life carbon framework from EN15978. As I mentioned before, SIPSI already has TM65 to address kind of this embodied carbon piece. We are reviewing to maybe use some of their methodologies to also address the MEP embodied carbon in US. So this is what we're going to end up in the embodied carbon side. If we're going to go down the road of the UK, from now till 2040, if we want to be net zero, whole life carbon by 2040, the first step is like what Larry was showing, right? You ratchet down the, not just the, the material scale, but the building scale embodied carbon. In this case here, the UK is limiting the, you know, different building type from five to 600 to about 400. But the interesting thing is they also start looking at upfront carbon use, recycle material and sequestration and also end of life carbon. In fact, by year 2020, the UK framing is, you're gonna have to use 30% sequestration or you re recycle material on the upfront carbon and 50% of your end of life carbon have to be able to recycle or sequester. So that's how they look at that. And as you go down in time, you're gonna have to up that by the year 2030 to 50% upfront, upfront carbon is recycle or sequester. And then 80% of end of life carbon has to do similar. 
and then your whole life carb and then your embodied carbon number will be lower no matter where what building type you are from 300 to 350. Um, so that's kind of what they're thinking. Of course, you know, towards the end by 2040, you will be 100% upfront carbon and end of life carbon to be recycled or sequestered in order to get to that whole life carbon zero on the embodied side. So this is kind of the roadmap that we may be seeing in the future. So finally, I would just quickly touch on some MEP and body carbon. This is from Carbon Leadership Forum, you probably saw. So, you know, just roughly looking at it, the MEP in these studies here, no matter your high performance building or conventional building, you are less than 100, 100 um, kilogram per CO2 equivalent per square meter. So if you think about a building right now, it's about 500, 600 per the slide we saw earlier. So MEP, maybe, you know, something like 100 out of that. And the high performance system will require a little bit more. Now, this study from SIFSI is actually interesting in the sense that they dive deeper into the HVAC equipment. What they find out is if you include all the refrigerant or the, or the you know, localized embodied carbon data, the embodied energy or carbon can be a lot more, especially um, you know, when you getting all those, all those details in what they think come up with the heating system of a residential building can be up to 25% of a dwelling's whole life and body carbon. So this is the later, latest uh, research they come out. So as we get better resolution on the MEP number, you, will, you could find some interesting you know, paper pop, uh, ideas, for example, for example, like this one here. So with that, I'm going to close it to uh, later on further questions. Thank you. I think uh, Panu can start. I think the uh, question and answer will be after Panu and feel free to post. Excellent. So hopefully the audio is first talk. Uh, all right, so my Zoom crashed. Hopefully it's still online. Uh, we still hear you, Panu, but haven't seen your screen state sharing. Cool. Um, I think you better go because. Yeah. <laughs> Try again. I think <laughs> I might be having the same issue here, to be honest. <laughs> I keep on crossing uh, today. Um, there we go. Uh, no coming. Good. All right. I'm trying again, but I will not put it on full screen mode uh, just to, you know, um, be able to do the presentation. My apologies for the um, deficiencies in the technology. So I will first um, talk a few things about where we're coming from because we are doing this um, at a global scale. So um, um, we have some concerns which may become apparent only in LCA data in that context. So we are uh, providing the one-click LCA to about 135 countries as of last count. And uh, we provide it for two main sectors. So we uh, provide it for building and infrastructure design and construction. And we provide it for construction product manufacturers to generate EPDs and publish them. So we work with the data, both at the side of the consumer of the data and both at the side of the producer of the data. They are quite different problems. And uh, we have a database which contains somewhere around 120, 130,000 data sets, uh, which broadly covers all the EPDs in the world. Um, we work with all types of uh, players in the value chain, excepting maybe real estate agents. Um, and uh, predominantly though, with everything to do with design, uh, because well, that's the, let's say the profession with the biggest uh, impact. Um, as practitioners, of course, funders have a huge impact and they impose requirements as well. The uh, way we look at this and way we are concerned with data is uh, across different phases of a project. So the concerns you have with the LCA 
and the concerns you have with the data are completely different if you are looking at the project in the earliest phase stages when you haven't even decided exactly how many you know floors you're going to have maybe uh, to the point when you actually have your drawings all done and you're predominantly concerned with sourcing and uh, the data problems uh, we deal with are across all these different phases because we provide tools for um, doing assessments at these different points uh, over a project's life cycle. And uh, what Eddie mentioned earlier is Carbon Designer. Uh, Carbon Designer allows you to literally do an assessment at the schematic uh, phase without any design information. So you just need to know number of stories, size of the building, country, and uh, yeah, that's it actually. So uh, you can very, um, very easily start optioneering from a limited information point of view. And then there's some in, in, uh, integrations uh, to design tools and such like. But now with that, uh, let's go into the LCA data. And uh, I'll be talking about it from quality, consistency, and verification points of view. Uh, we have um, made it a point to promise um, that we verify the data to our customers. Uh, why we have done this is because the data broadly is trustworthy, but all of the data is not trustworthy. And uh, we have uh, all kinds of problems when we look at the EPDs on the market uh, on the whole. For example, there's some, there are a lot of generator-driven uh, concrete EPDs in the North American market. And when we checked the data, we found 500, which had the word test or demo in the label of published EPDs. And uh, of course, that's not a very strong indicator of high quality, um, if you understand what I mean. So uh, we have decided that to be able to trust the results, the data has to be checked. Is it perfect? No, because we are not able to access the upstream data. We are not able to access what was actually used in the assessment. We are only able to access what is available on the EPDs themselves. Uh, but we will then check the things based on that. And uh, we catch, uh, let's say, um, less than one EPD in thousand is blacklisted, but um, yeah, but a few, um, like a, several hundreds of EPDs are blacklisted, but then many more get that that's with warnings because we have some concerns about their quality. And uh, in our case, the way we do this process is that we um, start by checking the EPD quality, and uh, we do it using a process that we developed originally together with the building research establishment, or basically they approved the, the process. And uh, we have three uh, scenarios. So when we have a pass, the data seems good, seems credible, all is well documented, it goes in. The second case, when it's pale, it's a blacklist, so, um, or for other reasons, um, discarded, um, we won't approve it. And the third case is when we can't prove that the data is wrong, but we can't prove it, or we don't know if it's right either. So then we attach a warning. Um, this is very common when we have, let's say highly unusual materials. So um, which have barely any comparison points. So um, in such cases, it's very hard to verify whether it's uh, credible. And then what we do is we add quite a lot of metadata on the data sets. So it's possible to understand what it's eaten basically. And then we release the data to use. Uh, but we have data available from the world and uh, some countries have slight differences in the LCA metal modeling methodology. So we actually classify the data into different domains of data. And uh, all of the data is never available in a single assessment tool. So if you are using one-click LCA, let's say LCA for lead North America, um, you will only be able to access the portion of the data which is playing by the rules set out by the, uh, the tool in question, right? Whereas if you're using the one-click LCA lead international tool, you would be accessing a different subset of the database and you would only see the data which is matching those criteria. Then we have some tools which allow you to access almost all of our data, uh, but those are typically, um, let's say, uh, for slightly different application than, uh, let's say, compliance or baselining purposes. So, but there's some 
quite a few, um, let's say, considerations around data management. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we do have uh, over 100,000 data sets and uh, it's pretty much every construction sector EPD in the world from over 60 programs. Uh, it's never exactly every EPD, of course, because new ones are published daily. So we are never up to date on the day. We will always be up to date with a month's catch up latest or so. And uh, there's a lot of different types of data um, that we handle. I will just go through the main categories, um, not to like get in too much detail here. So the first category are public EPDs. Uh, very clear, we review, we put it in. Second, public LCA data. So Larry mentioned he'd work with, um, you know, non-EPD LCA database back in the day uh, from the UK. We do have ICE database, we have EPIC database from Australia, we have a bunch of other similar databases. So uh, we do also have uh, public LCA databases, obviously. And uh, then um, because of comparability reasons and because of availability reasons, we have also generated our own generic data sets. Um, we do have maybe somewhere like um, 800 or so of those. And uh, those are then used uh, to have a comparable and consistent global set of generics. So whereas ICE represents predominantly, let's say UK slash Europe, EPIC represents Australia, one click as a generic data is generated in a way that it can be used as generic data to represent any location from you know Japan, Azerbaijan, Texas, whatever. And we do have then uh, energy and process profiles, which are generic. And then we have private LCA data, which is not controlled. So if you, you know, have private data, we don't check it. It's your responsibility. And then we have some licensed LCA data for which we pay license fees to somebody. And uh, in some cases, we have mandatory data. That's usually only in regulatory context, predominantly applicable in the UK, French, and Dutch markets, where there are LCA-based regulations. And then we have slight amount, or let's say a few thousands of data sets, which are not LCA-based data, but which are greenhouse gas um, reporting data sets, which are of course not available in um, LCA tools. So, but there's many different types of data we work with. And uh, as a user, you will always only access the parts of data, which are actually matching the requirements of the tool that you would use. And uh, then we get to the point uh, of choosing some data and uh, what kind of decisions you're making and what data should you be using. And uh, when you are making design decisions, you never start by you know, choosing the supplier or you usually don't start by choosing the supplier, right? So you start to think about how do you build? Do you want to do a post tension slab? Do you want to do, you know, maybe your location does hollow core. Maybe you can do bubble deck. Maybe you can do, you know, whatever. And uh, the first question is, of course, what kind of assembly or construction would you expect to use? Uh, so what kind of design would you have overall in terms of use of materials? And uh, it's at that level where you think about this first. And the second layer is, yeah, maybe I would use, you know, ready mix and this strength class would be fine for my purpose. Um, and then you get to a point where you um, have a supplier in mind and you are able to you know, make a specification and, and procurement decision. Um, and uh, what we would recommend is to always concern uh, yourself with the data that is matching the level of what you actually are deciding. So uh, no need or interest to use an EPD if you are making very early phase decisions, no interest in even like um, looking at EPDs if you have, or just barely looking at what type of assembly would you use, right? Uh, so we would recommend you to approach this from the point of view of assembly level, then material level generic data, and then look at the suppliers when you're actually getting closer to making such choices, right? Um, as the product develops. And uh, it's a very interesting topic. If you are very engineering minded, it's very easy to get carried away by this, but uh, you know, there's so many decimals that you can count it down to. But um, if your goal is to reduce environmental impact, you should always keep the end goal in, uh, in sight. So you should focus on the 
getting the important decisions right. What Larry mentioned is a very good, uh, you know, guide. Uh, uh, large volume materials, high carbon intensity materials. If I may, I might add to it uh, also short lived materials. So if you have, you know, carpets or such like, which live not so long in a building or internal walls, you might consider about those um, in addition. So um, be sure that the time you invest in refining uh, the data choices is meaningful. So you actually are achieving a better building as an outcome. And uh, in our case, we put these warnings in the software. So if we are concerned with it, but yeah, literally um, once an EPD is published and third party verified, it can still have um, errors. And uh, of course you can always try to benchmark the data if it's plausible or which end of the range it is. And uh, that hopefully helps you to make better choices. But when you choose a product, you of course should not only be concerned with the, you know, the carbon in the intensity of the product uh, itself, but with the carbon intensity of the product as you install it. So, you know, um, if you start looking for uh, the lowest carbon ready mix producer, uh, and that takes you know, you to hundred miles away, um, all very nice, but you're going to be burning quite a bit of you know fuel to get your low carbon material to your site. So at some point there's going to be a trade off uh, to be mindful of. Uh, that's it really from my side. Um, happy to join the discussion and. Uh, Talk about the matter further. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Larry, Alok, and Panu. So we have a few questions that I saw posted. Uh, let me try to pull one by one. Uh, I think the I think the first question is uh, for Larry. <laughs> Larry, there's a question from uh, Carl Johnson. Why do you average the embodied carbon? I think it's maybe related to your presentation. Uh, it happened when you build a building, so it, in his opinion, it should be just in the one time in the beginning. And another question is, uh, where do you get care? That's I'm interested too to know <laughs> where the software come from. Is it free software or is it a paid subscription or what's that? What type of All right, so let me take that in order. The, the reason we average is we're using this, it should be, I should have been clear, this tool is an estimating tool. It's not a design tool. It's not about specific buildings. It's about trying to estimate whether a, um, a replacement building of a certain efficiency is better than remodeling an existing building with a certain efficiency. And those are the two, those are the variables you're trying to compare. And generally speaking, if, the, if both scenarios can be the same efficiency It's almost always better to remodel but if the new building is twice as efficient sometimes it's better to replace so you have to take all those things into account and we're not yet at the stage of actually knowing what the building is actually going to be so we're really trying to come up with some simple benchmarks for we, we we developed four different building types for replacement buildings a heavy concrete those that chart i showed the heavy concrete steel building the medium building the lightweight building and those are our benchmark buildings. And obviously your real building is going to be different, but we're trying to give, put you in a ballpark. And then for the renovations, we end up with all this, this menu of different items you can pick on different systems and how much you're going to replace and like that. And we're trying to give rough ideas of what each of those embodied carbon decisions are. So uh, it's just to be clear that we're not trying to design the building yet. We're trying to make an early decision about whether we should even build a new building or not. That's what the tool is for. Um, the, the tool is not available yet. It's in Excel. So it's just we have to send them out individually and still kind of we're still working on it. So we have um, a developer right now converting it to an open access free web based source that will be available probably in May. Yeah, we definitely look forward on that one. Uh, second question, I think that's some more opinion, I think, but I want to hear more also from Luke. Uh, Kim have a question about uh, putting the refrigerant as a part of embodied carbon. Is there any, any benefit how we put uh, certain material in embodied versus operational? What, what do you think, Luke? Is there yeah, any, I mean, any impact in the design? Yeah, uh, it will, it will, 
Well, let's step back a little bit. I think there's at least a couple reasons why, and I understand the Kim's point that, oh yeah, that's leaky during the operation of the building, right? Now, two things. Number one, energy use intensity is not refrigerant. It doesn't include refrigerant, yeah. number one. Number two, if I build a building, come with a chiller and refrigerant, in the perfect in the perfect case, if there's no leakage, right? Then that's your total and body energy of the building that come with it. Now there's leakage because the system is not designed right. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That even the system design right, there will be issues that refrigerant will leak. And yes, but that is actually you're trying to repair the embodied carbon of the building. That's why it will be count as the silo of embodied carbon. It's because of those two reasons, it count as the silo of the embodied carbon. Let's say if you have a building has very little fuel installed piping, most of the refrigerant are trapped inside a black box. Your embodied carbon will be lower because there's less leakage. So it is a kind of how you do accounting. As I mentioned, scope one emission actually include refrigerant, car, car, refrigerant leakage as, as a fugitive. But there's a very different concept than the idea of this embodied carbon come with the building and during the in use stage of the embodied carbon of the building, you have to repair those embodied carbon. Those embodied carbon. That's how the framework um, works in EN 15978. I know it's like how you do accounting, but that's how you yeah. do accounting. <laughs> uh, so from your opinion, it's still in scope one in terms of like scope one, two, three, carbon inventory. Oh, no, no, scope one, two, three is very different yeah. than the embodied carbon OCA uh, function. I mean, so those are two separate things. Separate. But I know it's confusing because the scope one emission is, you know, it, it, it has that as fugitive, but we, in our mind, it should be very clear. There are two different things. Scope one emission is very different than LCA accounting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question uh, for maybe for Panu and maybe others can add. Uh, Going back to the basic again, so this is the question. Uh, going to the basic again, uh, he, he, the question is, with my colleague, we often debate, what is operational carbon? Whether it is just energy and water, B6 to B7, or is it include carbon emission of the building, operational phase, or B module, which will divide the operational carb embodied carbon B1 and B5, and operational energy and water, carbon B6 to B7. Is there any correct answer on that one? I think it's well, again, it's yeah. how we categorize uh, between operational yeah. and embodied. Well, yeah, you could say there's a correct answer. So in the uh, in the sense that the uh, the standards wise, the definition is that the B phase is operation, operation right? Uh, use phase, right? So um, all of it belongs to the use phase, happens during the life cycle of a building. Uh, the most formal definition you can have is in the World Green Building Council. And uh, uh, World Green Building Council defines operating carbon as everything that happens in the B phase, you know, from B1 to B7. Uh, and uh, uh, it's further splitting the uh, B phase into uh, use phase, embodied, uh, operating embodied carbon, and uh, then operating um, energy carbon. I don't remember if I mixed up the order of the words there, but like uh, the definitions in that sense, they are clear. So like we should be careful because in the in use phase, B1 to B5 are considered as embodied carbon per DN 15978. Only B6 is operational energy. B7 is operational water and they are looking at B8 and B9 to address transportation. So we should be really careful that the B category doesn't mean that it's operational, but it's the induced phase of the building. Right, right. Anything to add, Larry? Or? 
No, that, that's right. I mean, people, people confuse a use with operation, like Luke said, and it's not, it's not the same thing. It's everything that happens during the use of the building, including yeah. embodied, like replacing a window, the embodied carpet to do that is the same as fixing the refrigerant. It's all part of the embodied carbon piece. Which is not the GUI of the building. So right. like we, right. our mind gotta be really clear about this stuff, right? <laughs> Otherwise the GUI number will be all goof up. Right. right. <laughs> Okay, uh, let me try to add uh, one more question for each and see. Uh, Larry, uh, it's in, in architecture or building industry, we often see like, if my client doesn't ask it, we don't do it. So how do you sell a kind of like surface that uh, or oh, your expertise? We always, <laughs> we always get this question. There's two ways we do it. One, we just sneak it into the building. We don't tell the client. We just okay. put in low carbon concrete. You know, at this point in the Bay Area, it doesn't cost any more to do that. So they usually don't ask, most clients don't ask to see the mixed design of your concrete. So you just put in the lowest concrete you can find. So that's one way. The other way is if the client has stated goals about uh, reducing their carbon emissions, the thing that I always bring up is it's not just carbon emissions, it's carbon emissions over what time period. So there's the time value of carbon. Right now, it's really critical. We have about 10 years to make huge reductions. So if you're building a new building, the biggest reduction you can make is focusing on the embodied carbon. The, the use phase is gonna happen slowly over the next 10 years. The embodied carbon's right up front. So you can sometimes get their attention by saying, look, if you wanna make a difference, 80% of what you can do is now before you build the building. So that's that's how we approach it. Doesn't always work, but if it doesn't work, then we just sneak it all in. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, look, I have a question for you. Uh, from uh, energy modeling or MET design, are there any standard practice or typical practice that you think we should improve in the future to achieve uh, lower whole life carbon design? Or you know, additionally, if you you work in many high rise buildings, right? Definitely, and I saw like urban square. Yeah. Uh, what do you think that we learn from there that we can implement in current project or that you have been implementing your current uh, SOM project? So, okay, I think there's two things there. The first question is, yes, from the modeling side, we cannot just do energy modeling and think that's optimized, right? Let's say if I do a very passive building, with high and body carbon and low operational carbon. So you have to really look at how much and body carbon you have and how much operational carbon you have and find that optimum. It's not just, you know, it's not just about, I'm gonna lower all the and body carbon, then you won't do a passive building, right? In fact, you want to do a very passive building has potentially high and body carbon to minimize the operational carbon. So from the modular standpoint, that got to change and it's happening. We just submitted a proposal to the um, Department of Energy to seek a tool that can integrate Energy Plus with embodied carbon upfront using the beam model of the building. So you will holistically able to get those data in front of you to start comparing how do you optimize the both, that's number one. In terms of the op urban sequoia, you probably saw towards the end, I display a chart. The idea has to be just like operational carbon in order to get to zero and not use that much offset. It gotta be recycled and sequester. That gotta be building into the building material, a lot of that. And hopefully that will be a day and maybe not so distant in the future by 2040, between those recycle and sequestration, we can completely neutralize the embodied carbon without offset on site. Maybe it's a far-fetched goal, but that's something we should start looking for. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, maybe the last question, and uh, before we close this one, for Panu, I think I'm very interested in this. Uh, in IMAC, we try to test a different LCA tool before we subscribe to your <laughs> software. We see different results in LCA in the baseline and database. In your opinion, is the whole uh, life cycle assessment feasible? Is it feasible to be adopted by jurisdiction? Is it because I, I hear people, oh, certain jurisdictions start talking about adopting in that part of the requirement. Is it 
possibility on that one while well, we still juggling with the baseline. And when I work in the project, basically I adjust my baseline, then I adjust my design to make sure that it is getting a good number. Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, two part answer. Uh, the first thing is that uh, regulators are not required by any way to apply a baseline based uh, regulation. They can just set absolute, absolute target requirements. Very simple, very clean. And it actually forces you to do well and not to play nicely, let's say. Uh, but in the case of baseline, if you do it, uh, you do have to do it um, to make it like, let's say, rock solid. You have to do it a bit different, I would say. So Norwegian government has something which is called reference building. So it's not a baseline in the sense that it's um, it's flexible, but then it's strictly normative. And it's a, it's a kind of tedious thing because uh, it's normative to the mm, details in a way but it provides a confidence to a baseline. Um, but uh, it's, it's definitely possible to do. And uh, we have about 10 countries in the world today, which are moving forward with national mandatory regulation for um, life cycle carbon or embodied carbon of buildings and plus state level regula regulations in, in North America. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, is there anything to add, uh, Luke, Larry? Uh... Okay. okay. I think that's all for us. I think we a little bit exceed five minutes. Thank you so much, Larry, Luke, <laughs> and uh, Panu who joined from uh, another continent. <laughs> but we definitely uh, learned a lot from all of you. Uh, Larry, we will waiting more about the uh, care software. <laughs> Hopefully it's free. <laughs> and uh, look also, we definitely look forward to see more of your work on a uh, uh, high rest building and super tall building. I know we definitely uh, keep in touch and looking for more learning about more database, how we make a database cleaner. Because in my experience, a database is a big issue because we run a three software and we get a delta number is about 30 to 50 percent. So <laughs> we still even don't know which one is correct. <laughs> That's I think is a challenge for industry, but we push forward and we always try to make it the building better and better. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, don't forget, if you want to add uh, your AILU, you need to email. <laughs> and I cannot promise, but hopefully you can use for your architect license <laughs> extension. <laughs> there is a requirement that you have a five uh, credit now for in California, especially people in California. Thank you so much, everybody. Right. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Take care. Bye-bye.